1994, when the Internet, so far as the general public was concerned, was in its infancy, Vice President Al Gore spoke at a conference at UCLA about the emerging Internet, and he said, We have a dream for an information superhighway that can save lives, create jobs, and give every American, young and old, the chance to, to gain the best education available to anyone, anywhere. Which, at a certain level, is sort of true, in spite of the fact that the information superhighway has turned out to have a, a number of pretty rough speed bumps to it. It has put a lot of information at our fingertips, not as much as we had hoped, but still, I would hate to have a job trying to make a living selling encyclopedias right now. But more than just information, the internet has made it possible for us to be in contact with people anywhere in the world without any long distance charges or any delays. People can work remotely now. We can find information on almost any subject in an instant, whether it's accurate or not remains to be seen, but it is available. We have literally a university library in our home office available at the click of a mouse. Still, this access to information has not given us the excellent education that Al Gore dreamed of. In fact, most of the traffic on the internet is not comprised of searches for information. Most of the traffic is still pornography and social media sites, which may either literally or figuratively be pornography of a just different sort. We use social media here at church to spread the links to our sermons all around the globe, and I can say with a fairly high degree of certainty that without Facebook, our church would have financially failed a decade ago when our primary donors began to die. So I use social media a lot professionally, and I use it personally. I enjoy being able to stay informed about old friends who now live far away even if I could stand to know a bit less about what they are having for lunch. I was intrigued by an article that appeared in The Atlantic earlier this year in which the author, Jonathan Haidt, talked about why Americans have been so uncommonly stupid in the past 10 years. If I had written it, I probably would have talked about the last 30 or 40 years, but I suspect that I'm a good deal older than Jonathan Haidt, since these days I'm a good deal older than almost everyone. But his point is that the advent of the 24-hour news cables, social media, and the internet have given people the opportunity to choose what information they are willing to expose themselves to. When we hear someone say that such and such person is a Fox News viewer, we immediately know what kind of person we're talking about. A couple of generations ago, whether you watched the evening news on NBC, ABC, or CBS, that didn't identify you as being Republican or Democrat, educated or uneducated, liberal or conservatives, but folks, Walter Cronkite and his ilk are all dead and it doesn't look like there's even a demand for someone like them. There is no such thing as entirely objective news sources. Our news sources these days are not only not objective, sometimes they're not even news. You have to be carefully discerning to suss out what has actually happened that day without ingesting the refined sugar of the pre-digested opinions of the talking heads on TV. Social media can be even worse, disseminating cons conspiracy theories, propaganda, and lies to the public, a public that admittedly is just not that good at critical thinking. We self-select the people, the pages, and the sources that we will let into our, our skull, which means that we are constantly seeking confirmation of what we already believe. 
And we often do not even allow a new idea or new information that might challenge our comfortable beliefs to even come into our view. We all do it, of course. Social media would destroy us if we didn't protect ourselves from some of the vitriol and misinformation that some of our own family members and contacts are trying to spread. You don't have to rent space in your skull to your crazy uncle or to some nut job that just happened to have gone to high school with you. Still, we really must expose ourselves to ideas and information that challenges our comfortable beliefs, or we will just become a little more stupid every day. You think about it. If you have not changed your opinion about anything in the past three or four years, you are already the same as brain dead. You've stopped thinking. I'm not generally ashamed of my whole body of work, but a few years ago, I disposed of the manuscripts of my first 30 years of sermons, along with all the papers that I painstakingly wrote in grad school. They were all steps along the journey to becoming who I am, but some of those intellectual detours were so uninformed, so immature, and just wrong enough that I didn't want to leave any evidence behind after I die. Thinking people will always change their opinions in light of new and better information. But of course, one of the things that religion in general has in common with at least the Republican Party in general is that they would both prefer that you not think very much and that you never change what you were taught to believe. I'm going to invite you to check my sources on this. The link to the Washington Post article about this is in the manuscript of this sermon, which you can find on our website. But 10 years ago, the Republican platform in Texas proposed cutting funding for all critical thinking skills in the state of Texas. They said, and I quote literally, We oppose the teaching of higher order thinking, critical thinking skills, and similar programs that are simply a relabeling of outcome-based education, which focuses on behavior modification and have the purpose of challenging the student's fixed beliefs and undermining parental authority. Now, this clearly has to go under the heading of, you can't make this stuff up. But the sad fact is that if conservative Republicans want their voting public to keep voting for them, suppressing critical thinking is the only hope they have of ever winning an election. I don't say that gleefully or with any personal satisfaction. As I've said several times lately, I really believe that we must have at least two viable political parties in this country, and I wish we had four or five. But the Republican Party, as it now exists under its far-right and Trumpist influence, is not a viable party, and it is dangerous to democracy. And it even shortens the lives of the people who listen to them. I realize that may sound like a stretch, but once again, I will publish my sources with this manuscript. The British Journal of Medicine has just published studies showing that the mortality rate is higher in Republican counties than it is in Democratic counties. They don't list the reasons, but it's not hard to come up with some very credible assumptions for why that is true. Republican governors have been successful in limiting the expansion of Medicaid. They spread inaccurate propaganda about COVID vaccines, precautions, and treatments. And in spite of all of their pious rhetoric, they seem to have a huge affinity for heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine, and OxyContin, not to mention hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin. And of course, their love affair with guns is now causing more than 40,000 deaths a year. Now, you have a legal right to be stupid in the United States, but you should be aware that being stupid will shorten your life. You have to know that during all these years, 
someone has been listening to Dr. Oz and taking his advice. I think Oprah owes us all an apology for ever giving that snake oil salesman a public forum. But I want to reiterate, I'm an old school liberal. I do not want to see the Republican Party go extinct, but I do want it to evolve or at least to return to its roots. You got to remember Eisenhower was a Republican. And I can tell you as recently as 1988, when George H.W. Bush beat Michael Dukakis in the presidential election, one of my very liberal friends said to me, well, I didn't vote for him, but there is a certain reassurance that we can enjoy knowing that our country is back in the hands of the East Coast intelligentsia. And yeah, I was relieved that Ronald Reagan was out of office, although I'll admit trying to think East Coast intelligentsia while realizing that Bush put us just one heart attack away from Dan Quayle becoming president wasn't very easy. But you have to admit that Trump and Pence have made Quayle look like Aristotle. But given what our country has been through in the last few years, can you claim to be an intelligent person and be opposed to an assault rifle ban? We've had a million people die of COVID-19, and we're expecting a new surge of infections this fall. Can you, in good conscience, still be opposed to expanded Medicaid or COVID vaccines? To do so is almost murder through misinformation and paranoid political speech. Still, let me say it again. I am not ever going to be guilty of painting a halo over the heads of elected Democrats. I agree very much with what Dr. Cornell West uh, said when he kind of went on a rant on Bill Maher's show last Friday, pointing out that our primary and election system rarely gives us a choice between two moral or intellectual giants. West complained that our last election gave us a choice between a neo-fascist in Donald Trump and a milquetoast liberal in Joe Biden. Now, Bill Maher objected to West's dismissive description of Biden as being milquetoast, but West insisted, with all of these decent people in America, how do we end up with such mediocre people at the top? And I agree. From among 300 million people in America, our two choices were either Biden or Trump. Now, Barack Obama was often criticized for seeming to assume that he was always the smartest person in the room. But seriously, do you think that anyone has ever accused Trump or Biden of being the smartest person in the room, even if that room was Darwin's waiting room? I think Joe Biden is a decent enough sort of fellow, and he's done or tried to do a lot of things that I applaud. But we all know that we could walk into any Starbucks in town and find at least a dozen people who are smarter than either one of them, and most of them would be more qualified to be president. Our nominating system is absolutely horrible, which is why our health care delivery is horrible. Why our energy distribution is horrible and our mass transit system either doesn't exist or it's nasty. Look, I'm a very educated pastor and I think I'm a pretty good guy who's tried to do a lot of good things in the world, but it's no mystery that at none of our religious services in the last 40 years has anyone ever asked me to sing. I could do it, but it would be obvious to everyone immediately that I'm not qualified to do it. And so I'll be the first one to admit it. But we all should be willing to admit that our nominating system does not deliver us a choice between two of the smartest people as our candidates. And too often, it gives us a choice between two very mediocre and unqualified candidates who simply are not up to managing such a difficult job. Those are just the facts, and nothing would make me happier if you could prove me wrong, but you know that you can't. When I first read this article in The Atlantic a couple of months ago, 
My first thought was actually about the people of Russia who are only exposed, most of them, to one state-run news source. So most Russians seem, if you believe any opinion poll taken in Russia to be accurate, to generally be supportive of Putin and his invasion of the Ukraine. It isn't just the United States that suffers from a paucity of critical thinking skills. Most Russians, just like most Americans, are willing to swallow pre-digested views without much of a filter. It's a ubiquitous problem, and you have to admit that both governments and churches tend to discourage people from ever fact-checking them or thinking for themselves. Now, our church began 14 years ago with a small band of people who were disaffected refugees from traditional Christian churches. We had a couple of inactive members from the local synagogue and a fair number of confirmed atheists. But we had the courage to start putting the religious beliefs that we had been taught under the microscope and to slowly distance ourselves from the beliefs which we could discern were simply not true. We came to fully accept that the Bible was not written by, inspired by, nor endorsed by God, but it was simply a collection of treasured writings from a distant and ancient culture which could not be taken as in any way being a unique or authoritative source of wisdom. All of the writers of the scriptures of all religions as I have noted several times before, did not know where the sun goes at night. So they can hardly be counted on as a source of absolute truth. We accepted the full humanity of Jesus and all other founders of religious movements, and that whatever is meant by the word God, it certainly doesn't reference an imaginary friend in the clouds who capriciously either does or doesn't grant requests, answer prayers, or deliver presents on Christmas morning. Our spirituality evolved into a community searching for truth, for an ethical way of living, and a shared passion for making the world, including ourselves, better. In that same spirit, I believe that we need to put all of our assumptions, political, religious, economic, and social, under the same microscope. Simply choosing to watch MSNBC rather than Fox, as laudable a decision as that is, doesn't necessarily make you smarter, and it can make you even more insufferably arrogant about your prejudices. Wannabe billionaire astronaut Elon Musk has publicly styled himself as a free speech advocate, threatening to buy Twitter and open the floodgates of lunacy to allow foreign bots to spread misinformation, propaganda, and hate speech all under the banner of free speech without regard for how much harm has already been done by social media being used to spread lies and really, really bad medical advice. Just as we have had the courage to set aside a great deal of our most treasured articles of faith when we exposed those beliefs to the light of reason and found them wanting, we have to be more concerned with the search for what is true in politics and in medicine and in economics than we are in just giving a platform to lies and propaganda while it declares itself to be representing free speech. I will conclude where I often began with the wisdom of the great Dane, Soren Kierkegaard. He said, people demand freedom of speech as a compensation for the freedom of thought, which they seldom use. Let's face it, there is no way to make America great again if we cannot first make America smart again. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.